add them to the chat box. We will definitely answer them. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, we'll answer the questions in the chat as we are able. The chat has been lit all day. So <laughs> if you do not get to the question, we are not avoiding it. We are just trying to keep up. So also we will put, uh, ensure that you have the EGC email and website where some of the frequently asked questions will be. I'll, I'll, I can make sure we still end at two o'clock. So if anyone has a hard stop at two, I think we'll be fine. I'll adjust on my end. And then I'll make sure that Dr. Dowd and Dr. Deloach has the full slide deck for anyone that wants it, you know, that, that has a bad case of insomnia and wants to read it one night. Uh, I just need, I need, um, Screen sharing privileges yeah. again. I think when we, yeah, when there we go. All right. And so I'm going to just pick up where we left off. Do you have access? Not yet. It's still saying that it's uh, disabled. Yep, hang tight, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for your patience and flexibility today. This is apparently how we are starting another year. <laughs> Shantae, I'm just wondering, sorry, uh, I'm just wondering if um, because this talk was supposed to end at 12.30, that this is uh, Zoom's way of trying to kick us all off, potentially, and maybe that's something that Cyrus could uh, look at on the back end. I'll communicate with Cyrus to see what he's able to do to prevent this from happening. Cyrus is not Yeah, and it's still, it's still saying it's just uh, on my end, yeah. Yeah, you probably need to make him a co-host again. Yeah, for some reason, it's it's not allowing me not to do it. Not allowing me to do it either. Yeah. Um, Frank, I wonder if you could uh, send those slides, perhaps, to Tiffany. Or oh, uh, Saran is the actual host right now. <laughs> so maybe he has a permission uh, to do it. Yeah, Kieran, Kieran, make him a, make him a, a co-host. Let me see. Thank you all for the patience. Perhaps you need a yoga break, breathing like I do. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, if you all ever want me to come back and kind of talk more about some of these concepts, I'm happy to do it. I'm I'm all I'm always up for a trip to Santa Monica. Okay, uh, Frank. I think you you're oh, you have the um, access. Yep. I looks like I'm good to go there. Let me share my screen and I'm going to skip a couple slides ahead. So bear with me. All right. So this is where I want to be. So, and I think this gets at, um, I believe it was Dr. Claiborne who asked the question, why, why are we initially focused on equitizing gateway courses? Right. I know some folks are thinking, Hey, we need, you know, we need to be thinking about equitizing all of our courses. Or maybe some of the things that we're going to learn from a design perspective or from a lesson planning perspective have broader implications beyond gateway courses. And that is absolutely true. And I would say there's nothing that we're going to talk about today that you cannot apply to other courses that might not be considered gateway courses. But we have to have at least a particular and more intentional focus on gateway courses for the reasons that we see uh, articulated here, right? And so um, I would say historically or traditionally, oftentimes or sometimes some faculty have seen those introductory gateway courses as an opportunity to really determine and figure out who are the serious students, right? And so the course cannot have a, a focus on building students' efficacy or building their capacity or building their skills for what next. It really is an opportunity for faculty to make students prove that they belong here or to make students prove that they're worthy of the opportunity to be here. And those who are quote unquote serious students are the ones who make it 
and those who are not serious are the ones who get weeded out, right? And of course, I think we all can, you know, if we, if we were to stop and ask ourselves, you know, traditionally, what does a serious student mean? And what does a serious student look like, right? It's a student who's, you know, maybe attending full time, right? Or a student who, uh, you know, has, um, has the confidence and has the, the understanding of how do you go and build relationships with faculty. Maybe they're not a first generation college student, right? Or students who are not struggling with their sense of belonging or students who may uh, not need validation because of past experiences in education that have been less than, less than desirable, right? And so that's one reason why in some, you know, for, for, uh, for a long time, gateway courses have often had the highest DFW rates, right? Grades of D, grades of F or failure and uh, high withdrawal rates. Um, also, when we think about who have been, at least in a community college, and I would say, this is probably still the case at um, four-year institutions, as well as that historically, your uh, gateway courses have been taught by contingent faculty. Not that these aren't good faculty, right? Not that our colleagues who are part-time and adjunct faculty aren't good. We just know that institutions have historically done a poor job of supporting them, making sure that they have the resources, make sure that they have access to the information they need to best support and best serve their students. Um, thirdly, actually, because of reason number one, um, oftentimes, Gateway courses are devoid of innovative, affirming, and relevant pedagogies. So again, because these courses have historically been seen as kind of like introductory weed out courses, sometimes faculty don't really invest or put forth their best effort with regard to innovative pedagogy and invest them into these particular courses. And then as a result of all of the things that we've talked about already, gateway courses typically have the lowest success rates especially for disproportionately impacted students. Um, I would also say this, I think um, the, need to sum, the, the need to equitize gateway courses is probably best summarized by this quote. This comes from some, some colleagues from uh, Titan Partners that have done um, a lot of good work around focusing on the needs of the faculty and building faculty capacity as a result of the pandemic. And they say this, introductory English uh, STEM and other general education courses serve as gateways to degree path, but often function as gatekeepers. High failure rates in these gateway courses lead to significant dropout rates for the first and sec uh, between the first and second years of college and at disproportionately high numbers for poverty affected and racially minoritized students. I feel like that quote really just kind of hits the nail on the head, right? As to why uh, the focus on equitizing gatekeeper courses is really important. And the idea here is that if we can get it right and if we can improve success and we can build students' efficacy in these courses, then they can go on and be successful in, in, in um, higher level courses. And uh, that success can follow them throughout the rest of their entire educational trajectory. Um, another consideration is what Dr. Wood and I have called the pyramid of student success. This is Dr. J. Luke Wood, who some of you may know. And we've argued, we've always argued that both of um, both our perceptions of students and their capability of being successful and the relationships that we establish with them, that's really the foundation of student success. And from our perspective, these two initial elements are more important, at least when, we, when we're talking about, you know, the starting point, we're talking about gateway courses. Sometimes those are actually more important than what we often emphasize the most and that being our teaching and learning practices. So the idea here is that we really need to think about as we, you know, we enter these spaces, you know, what are our perceptions of our students? How do we view them? How do we view our role and our responsibility in facilitating their success? And what are the things that we intentionally do to build relationships with them, right? And asking these questions before we even begin to think about pedagogy, before we even begin to think about course design, and the things that we tend to focus most readily on. Um, the next consideration is that we have to think about challenge and support. And uh, I, I think probably most of us here are familiar with this concept. This comes from the work of Naveed Stanford. The idea here is that if we want students to be successful, if we want them to learn, if we want them to grow, we have to challenge them, right? And we have to challenge them slightly beyond what they can currently do without being challenged. Yet at the same time, we have to support them. And the amount, of, the amount of challenge has to be balanced with the right amount of support. 
Because if we over challenge them and we don't offer enough support, then what happens is usually what happens in, in our gateway courses is they become frustrated, uh, their, their self-efficacy suffers, and they begin to think, you know what, college is not for me. I knew that I shouldn't have come here. I knew I should not have quit my job or reduced my hours at work or took time away from my family to be here. Look, these are some of the early classes and I, I, can't, I can't even do well in these. How am I gonna be successful in the next class if I can't get past some of these earlier classes, right? And so support has to be balanced with challenge, but we can't just challenge students. We also have to convey that we have high expectations that in challenging them is Frank, yes, I know this is difficult, but I expect you, I'm gonna support you and I'm gonna support you because I care about you, but I also expect you to be able to rise to the occasion. I expect you to be able to meet the challenge uh, with the support and with the scaffolding that, that uh, we're gonna offer. And then this next one here, this next consideration, um, is thinking about uh, some concepts that that Luke and I came up with during the pandemic, when every every uh, everyone had to kind of make this radical shift to remote or online teaching. We talked about these five equity-minded practices for teaching online with an equity perspective. Um, I won't sort of go into detail here, but the idea here is that we have to be intrusive, we have to be relational. I already talked about relationships. We have to make sure that we're providing a culturally relevant and culturally affirming teaching and learning experience. We have to provide opportunities for students to build and sustain community. So not just see our classes as just a course that they show up to, but really emphasizing the whole idea of community, right? Being able to build community with each other, being able to build and establish relationships that can be sustained beyond the course and creating a culture where everyone cares about the learning and well-being of others and take responsibility for taking care of each other. So I like to think about this as like a sports team, right? Sure, there are individual people, everyone has their position and everyone's responsible for doing what it is that they have to do. But we're not successful, the team is not successful unless we're all successful, right? And we need to take responsibility to make sure that everyone has what they need to be successful. And then finally, race conscious, uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but it's really about seeing students' racial identities, particularly the, the experiences that, um, that are informed by their racial identities as assets that can be leveraged to facilitate their success. So this is where we, we start to really get into culturally relevant and culturally affirming pedagogy, which we're going to talk about um, in just a few minutes. And then I don't get the sense that, you know, remote learning and online teaching is going to go away anytime soon, right? I think we'll still, you know, give it, there'll still be some element of hybrid and online teaching and learning. And so um, the scholar named Garrison talks about these three presents for online teaching, uh, social presence, cognitive presence, and teaching presence. I won't get into the details of this. And all of these are important. Uh, what I would add to this is that we also need to make sure we have an equity presence in what we're doing, right? That's important. And uh, having an equity presence really is about taking into consideration the learning strengths and learning needs of diverse students and the non-cognitive challenges that often serve as barriers to their success in online or remote teaching and learning responsibility, uh, excuse me, um, experiences. And so being mindful of that as well. Okay, so those are our sort of theoretical and conceptual considerations. Let's talk about some elements of course design. So if we were to come together and say, okay, how do we make sure we equitize our course, starting with how the course is designed? The first question we have to ask ourselves is first and foremost, what makes a course equity-minded, right? We talked about those five elements uh, of equity-mindedness uh, not too long ago, maybe 15 minutes ago. So how do we apply those five elements and use them to inform what we do from a design perspective? And so there, there are 10 here that I'll, I'll, I'll highlight really quickly, won't spend a lot of time on these, but some things we need to think about. We need to make sure that equity and equity mindedness, that those concepts are intentionally infused at the very outset of the course. And that is reflected in the course's title, description, learning outcomes, and its theoretical perspectives. I'm gonna give you an example of all of this in just a few minutes, so, so bear with me there. Uh, we also make, have to make sure the course foregrounds um, the course foregrounds the identities and lived experiences of students who've been disproportionately impacted in education. Uh, the course has to be rooted 
in a perspective that prioritizes community and collaboration. We don't wanna create a situation where students feel like it's overly competitive and that they're there to outperform each other, right? The idea here is that um, we wanna make sure we do our absolute best, right? That we, we really maximize the opportunity that we have to be successful. And it's not about outdoing the next person. It's really about maximizing and doing everything I can to be as successful as I can be. And I think historically, particularly in gateway courses, we have done a good job of making it seem like a, you know, creating a competitive ethos within these courses. And that's just not conducive or beneficial to learning, especially from an equity perspective. Um, students and instructors have to have the opportunity to be both learners, teachers, and learners. I think some of us will probably agree. So one of the best kept secrets uh, in education is that we learn as much from our students as much as they learn from us if we create the context and the opportunity for them to share what they know. Um, and then we have to use a range of strategies to assess student learning. So it can't just be exams, or it can't just be uh, essays, or it can't just be one mode, right? So really thinking about and utilizing the full range of assessment strategies. Uh, continuing this conversation, uh, we also have to make sure that we use a range of teaching and learning pedagogy. So how we teach, uh, we can't just rely on one, one, one approach. Um, we have to think about what's the full range there. Uh, we have to contextualize the content. One thing that we know from adult learning theory is that students learn best when what they're learning is taught in a way that facilitates problem solving and real world application. So if I'm learning something and I'm learning it within a context that I'm gonna to have to apply it outside of the learning uh, of, of class, then I'm more likely to learn it in a way that where it's gonna really uh, be sustained. Uh, we have to make sure we're creating opportunities to build relationships with students, that we're intrusive, that we validate, that we humanize ourselves, that we're race conscious. Won't spend a lot of time on that one. Any resources that students need to be successful, we need to make sure that those resources are both articulated and shared with students at the very outset of the course, letting them know this is important. You need to access this. Here's how you access it, and here's why it's important. And then finally, any, any policies that we have that they cannot disadvantage, disproportionately impact the students. And so, um, you know, I know I went through, through those relatively quickly, but those are just some things to keep in mind. And so as I was kind of thinking about this and preparing for this, uh, you know, I asked, so what's the best way to really kind of provide a model or an example of how do we equitize a gateway course? And in doing so, I thought about um, a course, I believe it's a gateway course. I know uh, it may be on some campuses and maybe not on others. But uh, back in the day, one of my first experiences in working at a community college was, was as an adjunct faculty member in speech communication at LA Trade Tech College. So I taught on Thursdays from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m., right? So most of my students were adult learners. Most of them were working, you know, during the day. They had families, right? Uh, there, there was a high concentration of, of racially minoritized students in that course. And then they were taking a course that a lot of students didn't want to take. And that was Introduction to Public Speaking. And so uh, reflecting on that experience, uh, I asked myself, well, you know, how can we, how could I have equitized that course? And so it starts with the course title, right? So the title is really our first opportunity to let the students know that the course has an intentional focus on equity, right? And so most, most course titles, especially for intro to public speaking and many of our gateway courses, it's pretty, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward, like what you see here, right? And so if I were to ask myself, now, if I wanted to, to sort of equitize this, starting with the title, what would a better title be? And I would offer this one, right? By adding the words culture, uh, in a cultural diverse society, it gives the indication that the course will be culturally relevant. And that's one of the key principles of, of equitizing the course, is making it culturally relevant and culturally affirming. Um, the next question would be uh, the course description. And uh, let's, again, we're gonna stay with this intro to public speaking course example all the way through here. And so when we think about what does a, a typical course description look like for this course, I would say, again, this is a class that's taught at probably every college and university in the country, and they all kind of sound the same, right? And they all, for the most part, look and sound like this, right? This course is designed to help you become a, a better public speaker, 
You're going to learn about communication theory. You're going to learn about different types of speaking. You're going to be able to develop and organize speeches. All right. And um, you're also going to learn some things about listening and, and all that stuff. Right. And so this is what you typically get. And again, ask ourselves, well, how can we equitize this? How can we come up with a more equity focused course description? I would offer this as an example, right? Being able to speak effectively in diverse public settings is widely considered an essential life skill, right? Those who speak well in public are and are able to engage culturally diverse audiences are typically better uh, able to make, positive, make a positive impact in their communities and advance in their careers. This course will focus on helping students become more effective public speakers by providing models and examples of effective public speakers who represent a range of identities. Teaching students public speaking strategies that have been proven effective in culturally diverse contexts, providing opportunities for students to build their public speaking skills through practice and constructive feedback, sharing tools and resources for developing and organizing public speaking. And this next sentence is my favorite sentence in this whole description. Success in this course will be determined based on students demonstrating continuous improvement as speakers throughout the course, right? All with the goal of saying, listen, yes, there is an element of assessment here, right? I do expect you to, to grow and get better, but the starting point or the baseline is where you're coming in. And so I don't necessarily expect you to be the same speaker that your classmate is. I expect you to be a better speaker than you were before you showed up, right? And, and, and I think having this, this, this focus on continuous improvement and not some arbitrary standard that doesn't really account for where a student may have entered the course, it really does speak to um, the issue of equity and equity-mindedness and equitizing the course. Uh, now we have our course objectives and our course or our course learning outcomes, depending on how you like to describe them as an instructor. Um, again, right? We look at our basic public speaking course. This is pretty much what you would typically get when we look at the course objectives for an intro to public speaking course, right? All very important. By no means am I saying that these aren't important outcomes, but there's nothing here that speaks to equity. There's nothing here that speaks to cultural relevancy. There's nothing, there's none of that there, right? And so, you know, what would a revised set of outcomes look like? Here's what I would offer. Right, and there's, 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 there's a few that I wanna um, touch upon here, right? And so the question that we have to ask ourselves really is as the instructor, right? How can we give students the opportunity to first and foremost, engage their identities and leverage them to facilitate their success? Another question we might ask is what will students need from this course that will be valuable once they've completed it? And this is why we see things like being empathetic listeners uh, highlighted here, not just being listeners, being empathetic listeners, right? Because empathy and being an empathetic listener is really important, particularly in a culturally diverse society, right? Um, where cultural competence and cultural humility, right? And all these things are really essential in the current context. Being critical consumers of information, right? Look at number four, being critical consumers of information it's also very important. Right now, we are bombarded with information that's not really properly vetted before it's put in the public domain. And so we have to you know, ask ourselves, how can we help students in that regard? And then finally, being able to assess our own speaking, uh, being able to assess the degree to which we're learning and growing as speakers is also an important outcome as well. Um, next, we have the course syllabus. And so I would say that, um, and you know, we all, anyone who's put together a syllabus um, or syllabi knows that it has many components. Uh, we talked about a few of them already, like the title and the description and the learning goals and so forth, but there's some others as well. And so what we have to say is this, is that the syllabus is not just about communicating the rules and presenting assignments and policy. The syllabus really does set the tone for the entire course and it establishes the context of relationships that will be established between students and the instructor and perhaps even uh, students themselves. And so what, I, what I'm showing you here comes from the Center for Urban Education, 
and it's a syllabus review tool. You see at the bottom right corner, when you get the slide, you'll be able to access it at the URL there. It was developed by Dr. Maxine uh, Roberts. And I like this. It's a wonderful resource because it really helps us ask ourselves and gives us some guidance on how do we develop a course syllabus that's aligned with our values and principles of equity. And so in creating a course syllabus, we have to be mindful of language as an example, because that lets students know exactly what we think about them, how we feel about them, and how do we see them in, in terms of their capabilities of success. Now, some of this might not be as big of a deal, maybe for students who may not be first generation college students and so forth. But when we think about students who are disproportionately impacted, we think about where gateway courses are situated in a student's uh, trajectory, right? They're usually at the very early uh, phases of their enrollment. Um, this could be a really, a really big deal, right? And so uh, we have to make sure we're using language that conveys authentic care. So letting students know, I care about you and your success. I value your presence in this course. Everyone has something to contribute. I expect you to be successful. Uh, I love this one. We are partners in this learning process. So I'm not success. If you're not successful, I don't see myself as being successful as a faculty member teaching this course. And I invite you to reach out to me for support and look forward to helping you, right? So language like this lets a student know that you're invested in their success and that the course is going to be a good learning experience. And these messages, again, they're essential for students who've been historically underrepresented and underserved in education. And it actually increases the likelihood that they will persist and not just persist, but persist even when they experience challenges that make it difficult to persist. They're gonna be more likely to reach out for help because they, they're gonna be more likely to see you as a partner in their learning and in their growth process. Um, next, we have the teaching philosophy. And uh, you see here that there's no text after the word traditional because usually it's completely absent from our syllabi, right? So I, I would say that um, for the most part, we probably all have a set of values and a set of principles or philosophy that, that guides how we teach and how we go about um, engaging students. But we're usually not upfront or transparent about it. And so here's an example. This is actually one that I pulled from one of my uh, one of my syllabi. Now I will say this: I teach graduate students, so you know I think I have a lot more latitude with regard to what I can do. Um, and so this is my philosophy on assessment: how I assess student learning. And so I say, you know, I'll provide feedback on individual assignments, but I'm not assigning letter grades or awarding points for these assignments. This approach to assessment is aligned with knows its principles of adult learning and my teaching philosophy. And then I talk about some core assumptions of my philosophy. I want students to assume accountability for their own learning and trust that they'll do so. Learning and success are determined by growth and development and continuous improvement. And I don't believe in busy work, right? And so I would just say whatever your philosophy is and whatever guides your way of thinking and your way of engaging and you know, how you go about uh, working with students. Try to be as transparent and as upfront about that as possible so students know. Um, also, I referenced Malcolm Knowles in my teaching philosophy. I do wanna um, talk about what that is. And um, for those of you who may not be familiar with Malcolm Knowles, he's an adult learning uh, theorist. And um, he's done a lot of work that kind of talks about how do you effectively teach adults, adult learners. So learners who are not traditional age learners. So learners who, you know, from an age perspective, maybe in their mid to late 20s, they have significant responsibilities outside of school. They may be attending part-time. They may be attending in the evening and so forth. And so he talks about these six principles of adult learning as being really important um, and being, being critical with regard to making sure that we're providing a learning experience that's aligned with the lived experiences of adult learners. And that really takes advantage of, of, of the, the assets that they bring to the learning context. I'm gonna tell you what some of those assets are shortly. But the first is the need to know. So Noel says that adults need to understand why something is important to learn before they actually undertake and learning it. Second is the learner self-concept. And that says that adults assume responsibility for their own lives and decisions that affect their lives. Therefore, they resent and resist situations 
in which others impose their will upon them. Third is the role of the learner's experience. This is really important. I mean, if, if there's nothing that you remember uh, from these principles, number three is, is really important. Hear me out on this. Experience is an adult learner's greatest learning resource. Therefore, experiential learning techniques, as opposed to transactional learning techniques that enable adult learners to leverage experiences that are related to the subject matter are best suited. So when we think about our students uh, in our community colleges, again, they tend to be adult learners. And the value with that is that they bring significant life experience to the class, right? To the learning context. And so part of what we have an opportunity and an obligation, I would say to do as educators and as faculty members is to design the course in a way that allows adult learners to really leverage their experience, right? Leverage the things that they've learned in the workforce, leverage the things that they've done in their communities, leverage the things that they've done in their families as, as all opportunities to facilitate their learning. Uh, number four, readiness to learn. Adult learners learn best in comfortable, flexible, non-threatening settings, right? They're best positioned to learn when the learning has immediate relevance to their jobs or personal lives. Orientation to learning, adults learn more readily when the content of what they're learning is gonna be presented in within the context that enables them to apply it in real life situations. And lastly, motivation. And what Knowles has to say about motivation is that intrinsic motivators work better than external motivators for adult learners. So intrinsic motivators, like having a genuine interest in what you're learning, uh, increases to your, your confidence and self-esteem, uh, self-satisfaction, those are intrinsic motivators. Uh, by and large, however, I would say most of our gateway courses and the ways in which they're designed really focus on extrinsic external motivators, like grades, for example, as a way. And what Knowles tells us is that uh, intrinsic motivators are actually better suited uh, to meet the learning and growth needs of adult learners. Uh, next, we have text. Most courses um, are going to have some sort of text that's required. And what we have to ask ourselves this, and we're talking about equitizing our gateway courses, is that, um, you know, what are the implications there for racial equity that might e emerge for any required text and other course materials? Um, making, uh, making course text and materials less expensive and more accessible to all students has been a real important topic of, of discussion throughout our state. It's been a real important point of intervention for equity advocates. Far too often, students are expected to purchase expensive textbooks uh, that put a strain on their financial resources. And as a result, some studies estimate that more than half of college students experience significant delays in purchasing required texts, and some don't purchase them at all, right? So there's two things that, that I would offer with regard to addressing this concern. Um, the first is that you really think about, do you really need the text, right? So, you know, are there open access resources or open educational resources that you can use as a starting point? The second is this, adding a statement like this, I think is really helpful, especially when you have to have a text. So I understand that students may experience difficulty in accessing the required text for many different reasons. It happens in every course. Thus, I invite any student who is not able to access the required text to reach out to me directly so I can support you in getting access. While I'm comfortable with you sharing the reasons why you're not able to access the text, you're not required to do so. So just letting the student know that you, you recognize that this could be a challenge, um, you're there to support them through this challenge, and if they need to not share what's going on or why they can't access it, uh, you know, out, out of fear of judgment or, you know, the stigma or whatever it may be, that that's not something that they have to be concerned about, right? Just come to you and say, hey, I'm having trouble getting the text. Is there anything you can do to support me in being able to get it? Um, the second suggestion is this, is to really, again, I talked about this earlier, but really thinking about and utilizing and taking advantage of open educational resources. I think what the pandemic has um, helped us to do and, and, and having to do this remotely is really think about not just textbooks, but utilizing online learning sources, utilizing videos, right? There's all sorts of ways where we can deliver uh, 
you know, material and deliver content to students. And so I would say, you know, get as familiar as you can with what are some of the good quality open educational resources that are available in your field. Um, and again, right, it's not even just about reducing the cost. It's also about increasing access. And so there's another benefit as well to open educational resources. Having access to these materials can also decrease the amount of time that faculty are spending in developing original course material, live videos, lesson plans, right? There's a lot of uh, resources that are not only available for students, but also available for faculty. And so there are two websites here uh, that I'm gonna offer that'll be in the slide deck that I would encourage you to check out. Uh, before we get into lesson planning, this is probably a good uh, place to stop, check in, ask if there's any thoughts, questions, any points of clarification I can offer. We'd we'll love to hear what you're thinking and, and feeling right now. And I would say, uh, just feel free to uh, use the hand raise function and then just unmute and ask, uh, ask your question or share whatever's on your mind. And I know I went through that relatively quickly, so apologize for that. Yeah, Kevin. Yeah, um, I remember that slide we had like the three overlapping, um, uh, the Venn diagram. Oh, um, yes, yes. Yeah, so I was really kind of curious about like your thoughts about like community building, because even before the pandemic, that was hard to do at community colleges, as opposed to like four year universities where everyone kind of was in the dorm, they're already there. It was kind of easy for them to have that. But even before the pandemic, it's difficult for community college students to build that community. And I was wondering what your thoughts on how to do that and create a community that's also equity based. Yeah, I think it's essential. Um, but to your point, you know, students don't have residence halls to go to after class, right? And so we got to really figure out how do we do that in the classroom and how do we keep it contextualized to our learning? So collaborative learning is, is one way to do it. So you can think about, are there semester long projects that students can do together that requires them to work together? Or are there specific uh, class sessions where students can, can, can work together? Now, if you do that, regardless of which direction you go in, you got to make sure you're scaffolding it. You got to make sure you're supporting them. You got to be available to, to kind of help them work through the group process. So sometimes we assume that because they're adults and because some of them have families that they're responsible for, or some of them may be supervisors in their workplace, that they already have those skills and they already know how to do that. And that's not necessarily the case. And so I would say part of building community is also giving them the tools and the resources and the support that they'll need to work productively and to work collaboratively uh, on a project or on an assignment or whatever it may be, right? And that's, that's, one, that's one way to do it as well. But I think, I think it's absolutely important for sure. Uh, let's go in this order. I see Ian, John, and Sarah in that order. Yeah, I was just thinking, uh, I've been to a lot of meetings recently about uh, course outlines of record where all our course objectives and the course description and everything that you were talking about is. And it's a, I was just thinking about how much of a heavy lift it is to officially change all that stuff. Yeah. And, um, and there's a lot of like, just like institutional resistance. Um, uh, and uh, also about like showing continuous improvement versus some people are really like insistent, like they've got to meet those student learning outcomes and meet, show they meet the course objectives to pass the class. And um, I mean, I don't know if you have anything to respond to that. I mean, we can be naughty and like change the, change the language on our own, I guess, but. Um, yeah, I just want to add, that's exactly yeah. my question because I know that the learning objectives and the course title, all of that goes through the uh, curriculum committee. And I've heard from some of the full timers that that's quite a process. So, uh, you know, I don't know what discretion we have about some of that stuff that's that's printed in our materials. Yeah, uh, I actually served for the last couple of years, served on the curriculum committee at, at my college. And um, I'll be honest, it's, it's been one of the most like painful experiences uh, of my career because it, it, there is a certain um, there's a certain rigidness that's that you know that that's associated. It, it it has a gatekeeper effect. Actually, I think probably our biggest barrier sometimes are the the institutional structures that we set to keep keep things in place. I think that a lot of times that limits our our opportunity for innovation 
and creativity and to do the things that we know are what's best for students. So my advice is this, do whatever you can do without breaking the rules and without breaking the policies, right? So sometimes that means we gotta think a little bit more outside the box. So don't change the outcomes, right? If the learning objectives are fixed and you have to do that, keep them there, but maybe you come up with, you know, something else that you don't call learning outcomes, right? So these are the learning objectives. We're gonna meet these. And these are some things that you should expect to learn as a student in this class. So some skills or some, some, some key takeaways, right? Uh, make sure that whatever you come up with, that you can align them with whatever uh, learning outcomes have been kind of codified and approved, right? But yeah, I, I, I think that um, that really limits, in my opinion, I, I think it's those, some institutional structures have been established to maintain the status quo. And what we don't need is more of the status quo because the status quo has kind of gotten us pretty much what we've always gotten, right? Especially when it comes to gateway courses. So do what you can to work around and through. And then I would also say, I think some folks here should sign up to be on the curriculum committee. And, and, and part of being on the curriculum committee is being willing to advocate for change and to say, well, wait a minute, why can't, you know, why can't we give instructors a little bit more, more latitude in, in, in designing their outcomes? Or if, if there's gonna be a new course proposal, then I, this stuff that we're talking about here around equity, I, that needs to be a part of the rubric that we use to evaluate new course proposals, right? And so those are more longer term uh, strategies and longer term solutions, but I would encourage you all to, uh, to kind of get, as you learn more through this cohort and through this community, figure out how can you take these things and apply these lessons, not just to your courses, but also scale them up to you know, the program, the department, and the college and divisions that you're, you're working in. But I know it's easier said than done, for sure. My department chair asked me to serve on curriculum committee one more year, and I, I kind of felt a sense of responsibility to do it, um, although it hasn't, hasn't been fun or easy. But I can't be a hypocrite. I have to, now nah, I really have to do it, right? Uh, yeah, Sarah. Oh, um, can, you can hear me. Okay, so yep. thank you, thank you. Um, this is what I'm doing. I What I usually tell my students is, you know, I come from an advertising background. I worked for BET, Black Entertainment Television. And they're all like, okay. And um, they actually, at the network, planted the seed of teaching. I mean, I went back to school and earned all these master's degrees. But one of the things that I do is I like to create I, I teach to a theme that impacts everyone. So they, they can touch upon it and connect to it, let's say technology. And I give them a questionnaire. This is you know my advertising background, coming to see what their background is, what their major and their interest, so that they can connect when they're writing the final argument paper, they can connect to it, you know, their future and all that. So it's very like right now, for example, um, the MLA nine style handbook, I recognize that it's it's difficult for some of them to get this book. So I've written, I like to write, created handouts that will help them how to format a works cited page, how to do all the other stuff. So what you're saying, it's just, it's great. So that's what I'm applying, you know? So they like the fact that I worked for BET. It was a lot of fun. And yeah. it was nice because I live in Burbank and it was on Olive in Burbank. And then they moved to Santa Monica, right down the street from Santa Monica College <laughs> off of, off of Olympic, so, you know. That's cool, you. you should, so part part of what I would also offer, Sarah, is, well, we, remember we, you may not remember, but we talked about experiential learning opportunities. So taking the learning outside of the classroom. Mm -hmm. You should take them to a field trip to uh, to BET and kind of learn okay. about how these, these concepts that they're learning around advertising, mm -hmm. you know, how do they show up and how do they, how do you apply them in real life? That's right, because, right. um, yeah. Yeah, I worked with, uh, um, did the Charles Barkley golf tournament. I was involved in that, setting all of that up, connecting my ping client. And yeah, students would love that, actually. Yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> okay, let's go uh, Seahot and James, and then we'll stop there. Now, I'll, I'll talk about lesson planning, and we should have about five minutes for uh, some final dialogue and Q&A. Hi, Dr. Harris. Thank you so much for coming back to SMC. I took your course about men of color some years ago, and that was oh, thank the you. most useful things I learned about interacting with my students. 
So I teach chemistry and I know I see several colleagues here who are in the STEM field and, you know, that's always difficult to kind of um, relate some of the things we're teaching because it's fairly factual and dry uh, and technical to try to kind of bring the equity concepts in there. So I don't know if you have suggestions specifically for the STEM faculty. And then this, this sort of a follow-up question is you were saying earlier that, you know, it'd be good if we measure improvement over the the semester, for example, as opposed to some um, sort of external standard that's not, um, uh, it's not really like real standards, but we, we do a lot of times have to prepare the students for subsequent courses where there's expectation of certain entry skills going into those courses. So what would you suggest that we do? Because eventually when at the end of the semester, we have to say, well, if you don't master, you know, a certain set of skills, I guess you can't move on. And, and that always makes us feel bad about it because the students make great improvement throughout the semester, but they just haven't met sort of that list of uh, skills. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, really quickly, I think, again, I think for STEM, STEM is one of the areas where you could really do, you could do some real cool experiential stuff, right? Um, chemistry, biology. Uh, I, had a, I had a faculty member um, I was working with, I think he was at El Camino College and he taught oceanography and his whole, his whole course was around how, you know, access to the ocean and access to the beach. And, you know, I talked about the equity issues to access. And I mean, just real like cool, innovative stuff that had a real strong STEM focus and had a real solid equity focus. And so I think STEM is, is because it's, it's hands-on also, it's experiential and experimental, um, doing more, so, so being able to have students demonstrate their learning by doing things and not necessarily just taking an exam, um, is, is, is I, I would encourage you and your colleagues to really think about, you know, how, how can you utilize that, uh, those strategies more often. Uh, in terms of how do you assess learning at the end and make sure students have what they need to, to go into OCHEM or go into, you know, whatever it may be, um, I would start with some low stakes assessment early on that builds their confidence that, you know, let students kind of see where they're at and then kind of save some of your more, more summative and more higher stakes assessments at the end. But also, um, my guess is a lot of courses timed exams, right, that are not open notes, where it's kind of like you have to memorize everything you learned this semester, and, you know, there's going to be a time pressure, right? I think, I don't, I don't know that that's always the best way to assess student learning, and I don't know that that always gives us the best um, indicator that students have acquired the skills and the competencies that we're teaching. So, if you have to give exams, thinking about it, do they have to be timed exams, right? And if you have to give exams, can students use their notes or can they use their lab book that they've been working on and developing the whole semester, right? Um, is memorization important, right? So really kind of thinking, are these, do we just have it and we're doing it this way because this is the way it's always been done or because it really does give us the most accurate and transparent picture of what students have learned and what skills they've acquired. So I would really kind of think, think intentionally about those things. James, you thought I forgot about you, didn't you? Uh, no, I knew you were coming here. All right. Uh, I just wanted to address the first thing somebody was mentioning about sort of equitizing our syllabus from course uh, title to outcomes and things like that. Uh, you know, these things get crafted over a long period of time and institutionally it is really hard to change. But I know that when I create a syllabus, it is how I sort of come to terms with the course myself. Yeah. But there's no reason I can't create a B side to my syllabus. <laughs> right syllabus yep. I want. And that's certainly the way, rather than just reading through the syllabus and describing it, it puts it all out on the table. It's like, here's where we might be headed. And what do you think? Uh, so that means the first day, it's much more of a discussion of how we can approach a course altogether. And by the end of that, I'm probably gonna know how I'm gonna do my syllabus the next semester. You know, changing the name might take some time, but it's already on the table then, so. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, uh, I also like having the students have a voice in, in this process of what the course is going to look like as well. Now, I, if you all are like me, I will say this. I, um, so I, I taught my first college class as a graduate student at Cal State Northridge in, in SpeechCon. And I was incredibly insecure 
And I was very much concerned that people were going to realize that I didn't know what I was doing and that I was going to be outed as a fraud. So at my most insecure time in my career is when I had the most rules and when I was the most rigid and probably the least effective, right? And so I find that as I, as I kind of open up the space a little bit more and I invite students to really be partners in this and that I give up some control, which believe me, is, is not easy to do, that it does make for a more meaningful experience, both for, for them. And it takes a lot of pressure off me too, right? To not have to, to come up and enforce all these rigid rules and you know things like that. And so I would say, are there some spaces? You don't have to do it for your whole course, but are there some spaces or some things where you might be able to kind of open it up a little bit, right? Where students might be able to have a little bit more agency uh, in terms of you know what, how they're gonna learn and how they're gonna best demonstrate their learning. Those are questions I would encourage you to take a look at also. All right, let's talk about lesson planning. I think I can do this in about five-ish minutes and then we'll see where we're at. Uh, okay, so right, we got, a, we got a good design. We feel good about our syllabus. You know, somehow we snuck it by the curriculum committee and the dean, so no one really knows exactly, you know, what we're doing, but our, our course is officially equitized. So how do we, carry that same spirit and that same value and those same priorities into lesson planning, right? So I'm gonna give you an example of one thing that, 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 that works in the class that we've already been looking at, intro to uh, public speaking, what might work. So let's say I have a session on persuasive speech, persuasive speaking, which again, every public speaking class at every college or university has some unit or some focus of some lesson on persuasive speaking. So I got my learning goals here, right? I know what I want students to gain from this. I'm not gonna read them all there, right? But it's gonna be you know, some, some idea around distinguishing different types of, the, how persuasive speaking is different from other speeches, three different strategies for persuasive speaking, and then being able to evaluate uh, good evidence in a, in a public speaking, right? Some pretty, pretty kind of important things to do. So then I wanna think about what are the resources I'm gonna use to scaffold learning. So again, thinking about challenge and support, right? Challenge and support. One way that we help support students is by providing models and examples of what, what, you know, what, what a quote unquote good or completed project might look like, right? So if you're, if you're, doing, if, if you're teaching uh, chemistry and a lab book is an important artifact of learning, well, providing some examples of you know, some, some key aspects of the lab book and what a good one looks like is a good way to support and scaffold learning. But what we're doing here is this, I'm gonna say, okay, here, um, we're gonna do this. Um, I am gonna use three sample speeches that, have, that happen to be persuasive speeches that come from three racially diverse speakers that are also very persuasive, right? Because remember, I don't wanna just show them public speaking. I wanna show them public speaking with people whose identities reflect theirs and whose lived experiences reflect theirs. So I'm gonna pull a, a speech from uh, Frederick Douglass. I'm gonna, uh, there's this rapper named Killer Mike from uh, Atlanta who, who offered this really emotional speech about you know, shortly after the tragic murder of George Floyd. And then uh, Alicia Garza, who um, was one of the pioneers of the Black Lives Matter movement has another one, right? All open access resources. So these are all things I can show during class or students can look at on their phones or on their laptops or computers or whatever it may be. And then I also need to talk about my theoretical perspective. I'm not gonna go into detail on that. Just letting them know that everything here is aligned with a theoretical perspective. Then we got our learning activities. So every lesson has to have learning activity. And we have three different learning activities here, right? So the first, I'm gonna do a little bit of direct instruction, only about 30 minutes. That's gonna do, it's gonna be a lecture on, you know, what is persuasive speaking? How do you do it? you know, talking about social justice and so forth. And then after that, I'm gonna have the students work collaboratively. So that's what we talk about building community, right? I'm gonna have them work collaboratively and each student, uh, each pair, they're gonna analyze one of the three speeches that I showed them earlier. And they're gonna analyze in them by using three rhetorical strategies that I talked about in the direct instruction and letting them know that the most effective speeches kind of utilize all three to not prioritize one or the other. And then the next one is we're gonna do a group debate. We're gonna, again, have them work in pairs. They're gonna debate two other students on the topic related to equity and social justice. So we get our, you know, we're, we're engaging a real important issue. 
that's culturally relevant, obviously. We're practicing the skills that we're learning around persuasive speaking. And all of this is in line with the course design that we spent the last half hour talking about, right? And I'm gonna give them uh, examples of where they can go for open educational resources to, to get information, credible information to support their argument. I'm gonna show them how to access the US Census Bureau, right? I'm gonna show them how to use, utilize LexisNexis, Lexis and then I'm gonna introduce them to a journalistic resource the Associated Press, okay? I got another learning activity is um, students are in a couple of weeks, they're gonna to have to actually give a persuasive speech. And so part of what I'm gonna do is have students spend some time kind of working on and drafting their, 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 their policy claims or drafting some key elements of their speech. And I'm gonna be doing a group check-in and checking in with every student and making sure that everybody has what they need in terms of resources and support for their speech, right? And so again, I moved through that relatively quickly, but you can see here, right, that everything is, 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 is clearly equitized. It emphasized, so students are going to learn how to be a good speaker. They're gonna learn how to be good persuasive speakers, right? I'm still meeting that objective, right? I'm not violating any, any rules or any expectations there, but they're gonna learn how to do it and they're gonna apply these skills and they're gonna do it by applying it to issues and learning from examples that reflect them and their identities. And people who are talking about things that are issues that are relevant in their lives and in their experiences, right? And it's not just good for the students to, you know, the disproportionate impact of students to see this, but all students need to see this as well. All students need to see examples of this as well, because there's something to learn. Uh, there's something uh, from a skills perspective that every student can learn from um, applying it and going through these learning goals that I just went through. So I know I went through that quickly. Again, you're gonna have the entire slide deck. So, you know, you'll be able to access and uh, take a look at it. So we have three minutes for questions, questions, thoughts, reactions, anything that comes to mind. Is it possible for me to say something? Hi. Uh, okay. Yep, go for it. Okay, so I do African-American history at Southwest College. Uh -huh. And I mean, at Southwest College and Santa Monica College, and what's interesting is I have a textbook that's required. It's required at Santa Monica College, the courses, <laughs> I'll tell you, all of Black history in one class. So from Africa to the present. And so right. my, my question is, I want to just give some advice for the tactics because what I, all I can do is ask them to do the required work, and now the actual textbook is embedded since like 2016. Uh, that I've been using since 05 is embedded in Canvas. And so I tell them, you know, get a trial, uh, take time, you can turn stuff in late, but you have to cover the textbook. And so I'll like reduce you and give a lot of bonus credit for work outside the textbook. But of course, what happens? People try and get outside of buying the required book and try and do extra credit or something, you know, anything but pay. 45 to 70 dollars for the required textbook and i don't really know what else to do i i mean i i'm i i can not buy people books i wish i wish i was independently wealthy but you know they need the textbook to especially right now with COVID, is actually i think led to great for the students that get it is led to great results because they're like wow i didn't expect to learn that much but it's well, because they're on a regimen they're on a regimen so I would say this, 45 to $70 is kind of expensive. Um, and so I, you, you gotta have alternatives. So maybe the publisher can send you older editions saying, hey, I've, I've adopted this book for my course. Can, you know, are there some older editions that I could have or can you, you know, As can, pre can, you give me, can you give me four or five uh, copies that I can use and loan the students, right? I should have tried um, that one maybe, yeah. But that's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's kind of expensive. It, 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 well, that's the thing. And then that's kind of the, the it's like a crux, right? I'm African-American teaching the black history. I want everyone to learn regardless of their ethnic heritage. If you come, right. you learn, you can be the right wing Republican. But it's a certain thing that as a professor, I know, and I, I'm from South Central LA, you have to invest in what you're doing. So it kind of gets to be a, a, a combination of fight because I can't really, you know, the way it's formatted and the way it works best with this particular course format, being all the black history in one class, you have to like get through it, you know, efficiently and effectively. And the system they set up on purpose does that. Yeah. But it's no, not I, free. I, 
Yeah, and I, I, I get it. Yeah, I, I, I get yeah. it. Um, so so I would, I, I would, I, I would use this opportunity, you know, being a part of this cohort, mm -hmm. part of this experience, to reimagine your entire course and ask yourselves: Is there a way that I can teach this that that doesn't over, that's not so reliant on students getting the textbook? I'm not saying you got to get rid of the textbook, and but if, if the textbook is a key or like if they can't yeah. learn without it. Then I think you gotta you gotta rethink the course to be honest.